Welcome everybody to the meeting of the Hadley Committee for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. This is a special meeting where we're going to learn about zoning in our community from our guest, the clerk of our planning board, Bill Dwyer. So without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Bill. Thanks for being here with us, Bill. Okay, thank you. I love opportunities to talk about zoning. Uh, let's start at the very beginning. 1961, this is our zoning map. This was the original map that was adopted by the town of Hadley as its zoning map. Um, and it's a little hard to read all the cross hatching, but basically this is the business district. This is the industrial district. That's now on the far side of Route 116 and it's all swamp. Uh, this is the uh, flood zone, and this is also a business district, all the way up to the Sutherland Line, and all the way down Route 47 to Chamorro Road. And that little block in there is the, is the residential district. That's uh, a couple of streets with the really close houses on it. So uh, the idea is that except in the industrial district and in the floodplain, everything in Hadley is zoned residential. Well, agricultural residential mostly. Everything in white is agricultural residential. But everything else can also support residential. Business, residential uses are allowed in business and, uh, and now we have limited business and we have a few others. Well, over time, it got a little more complicated. This is our current, you know, let me just zoom to get height. Yeah, it's not all that different than what we had previously. We still have the business district, the industrial district. Uh, this is called limited business now, uh, and it doesn't go all the way to Sunderland. And likewise, this is local business down here. It doesn't go out to Chamorro Road anymore. And then there are all these, over, uh, these insets, which illustrate other zoning issues. But again, basically, everything that's not purple and this area over here, which is floodplain, uh, would support uh, residential uses. So all that seems fine. What's the problem? We can put houses anywhere. Well, you drill down a little bit more. And now, uh, the, um, the first one I showed you, the 1961 map, is something that I have copy of it. I'm happy to share with anyone, but it's not on the town website. The uh, zoning map and the uh, master plan update from 2017 are on the uh, town website. So you can see all of these uh, anytime you want. And we'll just adjust this again so it is fitting the Okay, so this you can download for your very own. Uh, so we're going to go to, this is what I just had up. This is the, uh, the current zoning map. Um, but then you start chipping away at what you can do with the zoning map. Um, or what you can do with all the land that's available. This
this one is labeled uh, scenic and unique. So we start putting in scenic resources and unique environments, National Registry of Historic Places, and various versions of uh, uh, wetlands, habitat, and all of a sudden it is not as, uh, doesn't seem to be as much space left anymore. And that is a lot of the constraint on housing in Hattie, that a lot of the the, the easy stuff's been done already, and, or has been taken already. In fact, a lot of happy zoning would not be, a lot of happy construction would not be allowed under, under current zoning. You could not build North Hadley Center under current zoning, which is 175 feet of frontage and a minimum uh, 30,000 square foot building lot. You just can't do it. Um, so this one was, uh, let me say this was, I keep on getting a beach ball because this is a huge document. Um, we also have some issues of stuff that needs to be protected. Um, basically we discovered the original zoning map had a couple of protected areas around the uh, Mount Warner well fields. We basically discovered that everything in Hadley is our aquifer. So uh, you have wetlands impact or uh, water supply impact in multiple places. Uh, where that gets to be a concern is if you don't have sewer. And the more you want to build and not have sewer, the harder it is. David Moskin is trying to pretend he's lost. Sources, basically yeah, okay. aquifer recharge areas. Okay. Uh, and we have another category. You'd be happy to know that Hadley has more acreage under protection of the Agricultural Preservation Restriction Program of any community in the state. Not per capita, raw numbers. However, you can't build there. That's the whole point of agricultural preservation. You sell the development rights in lieu of selling, you sell it to the state in lieu of selling it to a developer. So a lot of the areas that you see as you drive up Route 47, the fields to the left, the fields to the right, are protected, which is good. We support that. However, that means that there's that much less land for development. And less land for development means less housing. Uh, we also have this new thriller. Uh, that's one. The, uh, everything in green is a potential habitat for an endangered or protected species. Uh, the state has not determined that they are actually there, just that it is suitable for their use. So I had a client who was putting in a subdivision off Shattuck Road, and even though the land drops 20 feet to the Russellville Brook, there is a potential that certain turtles might nest up there. So instead of getting uh, 11 building lots, he got eight building lots. One of them's a really big building lot, but that's, the, uh, and again, that's without any determination that the turtles actually exist, just that it is habitat that is uh, welcoming to them. And 
And the final one I'll show you is one we uh, did up a few years ago. There was a question about research labs. And um, this is called uh, constraints. And does it look like somebody's granddaughter was coloring on here? Why, yes, it does. Uh, she's actually a little better than this. Uh, she stays in the lines a little more. So uh, you have, uh, this map is showing you uh, wetlands, uh, wet, uh, the uh, Rivers Act, 100 foot boundary and 200 foot boundary, priority habitat, areas of steep slope, 15 degrees or greater, and the FEMA 100 year flood zone. And so that, that kind of, you start with the, let me see if I can put up the other one again. You start with the nice white map <coughs> or in this case, the, uh, the beige. And let me get this set to try to get it into the picture. Right. So that implies, when you look at it, that everything that is that beige color is, and, and most of the red areas but not the purple areas, are zoned for residential uses. But then you look, so all, the, all those the wide open spaces, and then you look at this, and there aren't so many wide open spaces. So that's part of the problem with development uh, or creating housing, is that we're running out of places to put it. Uh, it's a balancing act because you don't necessarily want to see 40 acres or 60 acres of farmland converted to 60 houses. But on the other hand, if you don't have those 60 houses going in, uh, it, you, you are running into a shortage. The other big problem is that the zoning bylaw as presently written calls for one dwelling per lot. In other words, we do not allow multifamily uh, property except in certain circumstances. Uh, we allow it for senior housing. Uh, we allow accessory apartments, which is a second uh, dwelling unit attached to your current dwelling unit, one of which must be owner-occupied. And we do have a quirky little uh, clause that allows for uh, dwellings in existence prior to the adoption of the bylaw, that's pre-1962 houses, to be converted into two-family houses by special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. And the two-family conversions do not have to be owner-occupied. Um, and we have some big houses around, and some of that has been done. And then we have the, uh, uh, the zoning overrides called Chapter 40B, the Comprehensive Permit, um, which is what uh, led to the apartments over towards the Amherst line, the Winfield, which has changed its name now to something else. They came in at a time when the technically defined affordable housing units in Hadley were less than 10% of the housing stock. And under those circumstances, a developer can override the zoning bylaw as long as 10, I think it's 25, as long as 25% of the units in the proposed development qualify as affordable. And that's a very technical term. I'll go into that in a minute. As long as 25% of the units count as affordable, you could put in a 100-unit apartment complex and count all 100 as affordable, even though you're renting 75 at market rate. Uh, because we are now at 50, uh, the, because we have now crossed the threshold of 10% affordable housing units in Hadley, we're closer to 13% now, 
uh, we are no longer exposed to a 40B override of zoning. Uh, but um, that's why we have units like Winfield and the, uh, uh, I forget the name of it, uh, over by Stop and Shop, the uh, family housing, Burke Wag, also falls into that category. So the technical definition of affordable that the state uses is that a family that makes, I may be off on my percentages a little bit, but a family that makes no more than 60% of the average salary in the market area, we're in the Springfield Metropolitan Statistical Area. Uh, so a family that makes no uh, more than 60% of the mean um, cannot pay more than 30% of their income towards housing. So housing, and, and the, that includes principal, interest, on your mortgage, uh, taxes, and insurance. So, so to qualify as affordable, you have to be, you, you cannot cost more than 30% of the income of someone who makes 60% of the mean income. Uh, it, it may be a little more elaborate than that. So that's the technical definition of affordable. Uh, yes? Affordable, you said, in the Yes, we are in the metro, uh, Springfield Metropolitan Statistical Area. So, um, yeah, we don't get our own, we don't get our, our, we don't get our own determination. Is it like all of Western Mass, or is it just the River Valley? It's, I think it's mostly the River Valley. Um, the Berkshires not, are separate. I think the Berkshires are separate. Um, and uh, does it make sense? Yeah, and maybe it did at one time but uh, it's not, well, it is what it is for now. Uh, so that's your definition of affordable, the technical definition of affordable. Um, and that's what counts. We, so we have 13% of our housing that meets that technical definition. Um, the other committee, this is one of the committees that Christian Stanley set up when he was chair of the select board. And one of the others was economic development, which also has a sort of housing and economic development because you need a place to put the people you want to work in town. Um, so that's been working on some other aspects of this. And it is something that probably you know, we should all get together or try to get the select board's attention at some point. Because I don't think it was Christian's idea when he got started to have all of his groups working, all of the groups he set up to be working towards the same goal. But maybe it, maybe there's some benefit to approaching it from multiple angles. I, I don't know. But um, don't want to duplicate effort. But so the basic thing is uh, once you get past the technical definition of affordable, you still have the definition of the, 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 the small a definition of affordable is as something that is not going to bankrupt you to live in. And that's probably an area where we have a gap. We have older housing that fits in there. Um, I'm just talking about, first of all, let me just talk about single family owned properties. Uh, not rentals, not multifamily rentals, but just single family owned properties, the, um, there's, there, there are tiers. There are, say, the up to three, up to 350, 350 to 450 in that area. Um, not a lot on the market in that, uh, in that area. Uh, they tend to be smaller, they tend to be older. Um, there are, there's another tier that's the six to 800 and over. Um, that's where a lot of the new construction is. Um, and I've talked to developers and it, it just is more cost effective for them to build the McMansion 
than it is to build a three bedroom, two bath ranch. Because they have, they don't have a huge amount of extra site preparation work. They don't have a huge amount of extra work to do to build a four bedroom, five bathroom house. But the margins are so much better for them that that's where they, by and large, are concentrated. So we don't have, um, the assessors carry a generic building lot, minimum size, on a busy street at a value of about $130,000. So, um, you know, right off, you want to you want to give your child, or get your child to, to build a house in Hadley. So, probably the cheapest parcel they could find is $130,000 to $150,000. And then they have to build something on it. And now you're up in the, you're probably up in the 400s in a heartbeat, uh, especially with construction prices being what they are. What we have stayed away from is apartment, apartments, garden apartments, uh, townhouses, you know, call it what you will. The major concern in our microeconomy is that we're going to get, uh, the students are going to outbid anybody. Now in Amherst they're building multi-story apartments that, that I understand and I haven't actually seen an agreement for this, but I understand they're basically, they'll take a four bedroom apartment and they're renting it by the bedroom. Uh, so it's not like the standard rental. You know, I, have a, I have a house next door to me that I rent as a house. And sometimes there's a family and sometimes there's a group of unrelated people there. But I am renting a house to people who are living there, uh, not renting four bedrooms. Uh, that is what you're seeing in students the student community can afford to pay more than perhaps the average you know, three or four member family. Um, now I know that Molly Keegan, who may join us, I promise to try to be done before she gets here. Uh, Molly Keegan may uh, join us. She, she has been an advocate for some time for actually trying to work in a combination of housing, such as townhouse apartments, uh, and perhaps something, you know, along the uh, Route 9, oh. uh, maybe something in the business district. It's called mixed use. And uh, the classic mixed use is Northampton, where you have Retail on the first floor, uh, generally offices, historically offices on the second floor, and uh, apartments on the third floor. And that all seems nice. Um, but Northampton's slightly different dynamic than we are. So, and not only do you need space to build the structures, but you need the parking to go with it. And with parking, you need access whether it's traffic light, signalized intersections. Um, so there's some possibilities that are interesting, like maybe combining, uh, putting apartments at, at Hampshire Mall, for example. Um, as I understand it, the big catch to that is that uh, those buildings were not designed to bear extra weight. So that if you did try to put a, a floor of apartments above Target, you basically would have to rebuild Target to get there. Uh, whether that's cost effective or not, I don't know. Uh, anyway, those are the, some of the things that are floating around. So there's no great solution for how to get, we'll call it the middle range of affordability. Um, you know, how, how to get a range of housing that would be attracted to people and would not break the bank. So um, I think that's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, so 
that's a good question. The idea of cluster housing, which I don't understand very well. So I always thought a, a nice solution would be small affordable homes, circular little road, maybe a community building in the middle, and that that might be a profitable uh, concept for a developer as opposed to the, uh, having a mansion yep. or a margin would be better. Is that um, ever discussed? It was developer? discussed. There was an article from uh, to adopt a cluster zoning bylaw uh, that went down in flames at town meeting. Um, How long ago was that? Uh, probably about 15 years ago now. Well, why would it have gone down? The fear of brown people or uh, schools or? Uh, uh, not even that far. Uh, the, uh, Overcrowded schools? Or? I think part of it was the, it wasn't as Joseph Rodman likes to say, I'm leery of anything that makes it uh, cheaper for the developer to throw up a building. Uh, in that case, they didn't really think it through. They talked about cluster, but they didn't think it through that it really had, if you're going to cluster, you have to be on a sewer. And that takes half the town off the table right away. Because if you don't, if you're on septic and the septic fails and you have to rebuild it, you need space to do it. And the cluster proposal <coughs> did not have enough space. The other thing that they, uh, they were talking with on cluster was that they wanted to uh, use have a set aside for egg space. And the for what space? Sorry, agricultural oh, space. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we'll take a 10 acre parcel, we'll put instead of 10, 10 acres, 10 houses on one acre lots, we'll put 10 houses on five acres and keep the other five open. Um, but then you get into a question, well, what, which five are you going to keep open? Uh, don't you? Uh, uh, and then there's a potential conflict. It was a concern at the time, definitely a conflict between, OK, now you have a farmer who is working those five acres next to your 10 houses. And we know that people tend to clash over farming practices, like spreading manure on fields, uh, plowing and picking, picking up dust at 6 a.m. Yeah. So Bill, you've been doing this a long time. Forgive me for asking another question. But, uh, you've been this for, doing this for a long time. You're probably going to have grandkids someday. You may not be the average uh, happy family. But uh, in the back of your mind, what, what do you see as being the potential solutions to have more affordable housing. Do you think the apartments and the townhouses is probably the most likely path or a cluster or? It, you know, it could be, but it would, there are a lot of demographics to think about. You know, if you're trying to create, uh, so let me just see if I, I don't know why this isn't working. Um, your, that's your only bus line. I mean, there, technically there is one that goes to Mount Hood, but I don't know how often that runs. So right off, you're, saying, you're kind of saying, well, you see there's a lot of development constraint down there anyway. But um, so where are you going to put it? Um, probably cluster, or probably townhouses along Route 9 would not, not be the end of the end of Hadley as we know it. They're not going to take away farmland. Um, but we also found, uh, we just had a process, a, uh, uh, an application for site plan approval for a uh, retail marijuana dispensary on Route 9 in a pre-existing business building and got quite a bit of resistance and objections from abutters because they're living there. People are running a business out of the house on Route 9. They don't want the business next to them, even though they know they are in the middle of the business district. So yeah, there's going to be a certain degree of that, too. 
but maybe apartments off of Route 9 where you have to walk up to the bus stop or have enough parking, that could work? That could work. Uh, personally, I would be happy with accessory apartments by right, uh, although then you get a situation where someone who shouldn't be doing an accessory apartment riles up his neighborhood. Uh, we do not presently allow detached accessory apartments. Uh, I'd like to see that as an option. Uh, but that's nib just nibbling at the edge. The accessory apartments are just nibbling at the edges. The, um, what about the whole building lot size yeah. issue? I mean, it seems like personally, I own more grass than I would like to, <laughs> but I, there, there's no options for, for changing that. Um, and I think a lot of people are on, I mean, most of the houses are on big lots in Hadley. Right. Um, and so are there routes to change that? Uh, yeah, I suppose there is a potential for maybe cutting back frontage a little bit. Uh, right now it's 175. It was 125. Does that just mean the width of your, of, Yes. Of, okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so you could fit more lots on a street if yeah. you had less frontage. Um, I would have to check. By, part of it depends on where you are. If you're on sewer, that's one thing. If you're on septic, that's another. And this is one of those things, this is why we don't allow hearsay in court. <laughs> Someone mentioned at one point that there, there is a correlation between the septic system design is based on the number of bedrooms you have. And it requires that you have X number of square feet per bedroom. And I think one of the correlations at one point was that um, to put up a four bedroom house, you do need 30 to 40,000 square feet of land to satisfy Title V, which is the state sanitary code, which has absolutely nothing to do with town zoning. Um, and that's something that I would like to, I probably should dig into it at some point. Um, so, yes, could you have smaller lots on sewer? Perhaps. Uh, but then you're running into the maps you showed us indicate like what parts of Hadley are on sewer? There is one of the maps does have <coughs> yeah. that detail. Uh, I couldn't blow it up here, but, but I would assume that like along the Route 9 corridor there's so, probably So yes, yeah, definitely it's along the Route 9 corridor. And it also goes up as far as uh, come on, you are a selectman, you should know this stuff. Where the sewer line go, goes? goes up River Drive to uh, Stockbridge Road, and then goes out Stockbridge and comes back down South Maple. So part of the layout was to protect the uh, Lake Warner from various levels of pollutants, mm -hmm. and also to protect the uh, Mount Warner well fields, which are right in, in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what that's where the the sewer is run <coughs> to protect uh, areas that we want to not have contamination. Um, now, some of the streets in here in this uh, this was a, a subdivision that was put in prior to the zoning. Uh, uh, late 50s and early 60s, and uh, I'm forgetting the names of the streets in there. But uh, that's like along Rocky Hill? Yes. Like that area. Yeah. yeah. And those are all 125 feet uh, frontage and 20,000 square foot, and um, multiple complaints about failed septic systems in there and sales being held up. Um, but uh, not a lot of interest in putting sewer in there because there's nothing to protect against. Uh, I think some there's been some compromise and some is being done. I live up up here and I'm never going to see sewer in my lifetime. I don't think. Uh, I'm sorry. So what is the what is the what prohibits putting sewer? Like I'm just thinking along like the Rocky Hill corridor. Oh, nothing prohibits putting sewer okay. except the expense. 
Well, actually, Which is not to, <laughs> and, and the constraint on the expense, if, if anybody remembers, we had a proposal to rezone a parcel of land, uh, yeah, there. Uh, no, it was over on, just on the other side of the rail trail uh, for senior housing. And uh, the neighbors didn't want a project going on in their backyard for two or three years. And one of the issues that was raised is how much, this will be on sewer, how much we, we have a tipping point, we have a sewer system that has this much capacity, and you know, the closer we get to capacity, um, we're now looking at building a new sewer plant. So that's the type, it's not just the cost of digging the ditch and putting the sewer line down, it is uh, you know, how are we going to treat the extra product I remember that was a big issue a few years ago that we were nearing our capacity for wastewater treatment, which was a strong argument against what we were talking about here. Because that's going to be a big hit. Uh, you can borrow for that. In, in turn, that means you have to. The sewer treatment plant is at the south end of Middle Street, and it's the logical place for it. It's also the DPW yard. And if the sewer plant has to be expanded, then you have to find someplace else for the DPW. So that's the second cost hit. <coughs> Somebody had a question? I had the same question that she had. Oh, if, there okay. was a, if there was a visual of the Yeah, sewer. There, there is. As you can see, some of these are just so overlaid. Um, and it may be the 152, the water. Let me see. Corridor. 
how good is the infrastructure that's there now? Would that, would that be a big deal to accommodate? Uh, so it is a big deal already. But there is a plan to piggyback water and sewer improvements on the Route 9 reconstruction mm -hmm. if the town can get its act together to work on the state schedule. Uh, because yeah, the, the state is going to dig everything up. And if we can follow along and dig up our pipes, which are in the, the state right away, while it's already open, we have saved all the expense of opening it and the expense of closing it up again. Um, but right now, that proposal just goes from uh, town hall to um, right in front of Home Depot. So, and I'm not sure if there is a plan, I'm not sure if increased capacity is part of the plan or not, or just getting on top of the fact that you're dealing with 100 year old product, 100 year old pipes in there. Bill, if the town wanted to ask for increased wastewater treatment capacity, from the state, uh, who would do that? Who, who would do that, uh, that ask? Uh, DPW, I would suppose. Mm -hmm. But there's, there is a conversation going on right now with Amherst. Uh, about be, increasing be, wastewater treatment? About sending our sewage to Amherst. Mm -hmm. Because my understanding, at least the last I left off, was that in order to increase the capacity of our plant, <clears throat> you're talking but really big numbers compared to <clears throat> trying to be cooperative with the neighboring town because they do have capacity. Okay. So one happy scenario could be, I don't know what the word spot zoning really means, I don't remember anymore, but uh, if we could find an area that's on sewer, on the bus, near the sewer, near the, I mean on sewer, near the bus routes, and allow smaller lot sizes or some way of encouraging a private developer to put up affordable single family or apartments that could all come together. Uh, what's, the sure. biggest, Bill, what's the biggest constraint in your mind? Wastewater capacity or? So part of it also is that Route 9 is our cash cow. It's our business district. And um, it's a concern if you start putting and mixing other uses in because that is the tax revenue that drives the rest of the town. That's what keeps the tax rate low enough for the farmers to keep on <coughs> farming. I'm missing something. Wouldn't building buildings increase property tax? If not, uh, not necessarily, if it increases demand for services. So the, the average, and this, these are gross generalizations, but the average business parcel is much more profitable for the town because That's they consume yeah. less yeah. than they pay in taxes. And there are, is documentation at the state executive office of housing and I forget which alphabet it is, DHCD. Anyway, uh, the, you know, the, there, there's acknowledgement that the average single family home consumes more than it pays. Really? But well, we're also in a good spot right now relative to the schools because the schools have significant capacity now, mm -hmm. which that wasn't where we were at when, when was the elementary school? Was that 1990 or something? Uh, yeah. yeah, it would have been about 1990. Right. Uh, and then like in the early two, early 2000s, there was a concern that they didn't make it big enough. But that's completely flipped now. So, so that, that's the good news of these. It's not a conversation about schools, you know, needing to be expanded. But everything else, fire, police, all that. Right. So it, it, it's, uh, it, it, again, it's a balancing act. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, how, if you have a business district, how many, how much, many residential uses do you want to inject there w before people start complaining about the business district? 
So I, I think you missed the first map I put up. Um, Can you say what you mean by that? Hmm? Before people start complaining about the business district. Oh, uh, okay, so you have a situation that, that part of zoning is to keep like kind uses together. So you put all your manufacturing in one part of town, you put all your retail in another part of town, uh, and you put your housing in another part of town. And now you start putting housing in with the industrial uses or the uh, <coughs> business uses, and then you've created you sort of undercut the point of zoning in the first place. Um, now technically, we do allow it. In fact, we allowed it because so many, when, when we first adopted the bylaw, the Route 9 was pretty much, let's see, where do I want to go? Throw one more here. When we first adopted it, there was a lot of residential on Route 9. <laughs> And you still see a fair amount of residential between the bridge and the bike path, say. Versus from the bike path to the Amherst Town line, there are probably three houses at most. Um, but again, that's sort of the point of zoning, is to keep, keep unlike things apart. And if you start blurring the lines, um, you, you might as well not, not bother with the zoning. Uh, we have enough constraints otherwise anyway that maybe zoning has, has perhaps outlived much of its usefulness. But, uh, but yeah, you, you want to, if, if people are going to be living next to Walmart and start complaining about Walmart getting deliveries at 5 a.m., uh, you've created a problem that maybe you didn't need to create, especially since it was always set up as a business district. I, I think you actually did, oh, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Uh, at present, are there many residential places in business districts in Evan? Uh, you drive the length of Route 9, and that's all a business district. So every dwelling you see on Route 9 is in a business district. And when they complain, knowing that they bought a business district, how much weight does that have? Um, some. And in some cases, they have other routes of complaining. They don't have to complain to the town. They can complain to state environmental agencies. Uh, they can take their neighbor to court, all of which has been done. Uh, so, uh, it, yeah, it, it, uh, there are flashpoints at where dwellings and businesses abut, no doubt about it. And some, uh, many of those are actually rental properties, too. Um, and maybe that, in some way, reduces the flashpoint. One, one thing we had was the, uh, the, the boarding kennel over here wanted to create an outdoor walk space, but there are a couple of houses, both of which are rentals, nearby. Um, so we made a special point of notifying the owners of those properties that the dog kennel wanted to create an outdoor run. And those people didn't bother showing up. Uh, maybe the tenants will complain, but... Um, Also, it's, it's pretty quiet and constrained, so we weren't worried about it, but people do. Um, I don't know if you know or not, but sorry, uh, like where that solar field is going up behind Maple Farm? Yeah. Foods, kind of? Was there ever a discussion over the last 30 years that that might be a place to put a apartment or cluster, you know, affordable house, you know, single family or anything? Or I don't know. I don't really know that land. But that, uh, it's, it is. Um, it is wet. It's business zone, but it's unbuildable. 
So that's going to grow. It is kind of swampy back there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the owner is probably the best. Yeah, the owner tried to get, uh, he had hopes of uh, getting an access onto uh, the road that goes through fish and wildlife. Moody Fish? Uh, no, the um, where Staples and the Credit Union are. Uh, oh. Westgate Center yeah, Drive. Yeah. He owns up to the end of that, but he gave up doing any worrying about it because there wasn't much he could do. In fact, he had to get a variance because we don't allow, we decided not to allow solar fields in business districts because we wanted to preserve the business land for those who wanted to do brick and mortar business. And he got a variance from the ZBA on the basis that it was too wet to build. Wait until you see the uh, climate control stories that's going to go up south of the bike path. Right. Industrial zone land. But no, but to the point of your question, was there ever talk about something being better for housing? You know, we don't have that conversation on an ongoing basis, really. Um, it is not something that people are coming to us and saying, you know, can't we, can't we have smaller lots? Um, and so we haven't really looked into it in, in a long, a long time. But that's really, that was a major driver for the Housing and Economic Development Committee, was to start this conversation before we had to have it, you know, and not try to be proactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if builders aren't seeing a benefit to do that type of development, then where is the voice for mm -hmm. affordable housing and having? Mm -hmm. Well, green leaves and whatever they're called now, they're, I think they're full, right? They're nearly full. And I've talked to people who live there and they like it. Yep. So that's multi-story apartments, and, you know. So that was, that was a 40B, and I think right. we discussed that a little bit before you came in, okay. that on a 40B, you have to dedicate a percentage, which I think is as low as 25% to affordable. Right. And you can count 100% as affordable yeah, towards the inventory. Uh, so it, it's, that's part of why a 40B is attractive because you can put in market rate apartments uh, and get all sorts of tax credits and things like that. So did like Gates and Johnson or whoever they are ever approach your board to ask if there was interest in Hadley and doing that? Because normally you wouldn't allow apartments here in Hadley, right? right. But did they ever say, would you be interested in the discussion about changing that? No, they bought the land and said, we're going to do a 40B. Okay. Uh, so that was yeah, it. No, I remember what that happened. And it drove them bankrupt. It did what? They, their business went bankrupt. No. Really? And then the um, whoever finished the project bought it from the trustee in bankruptcy. Okay. So. I wanted to come back to something you said earlier, and I, I, I'm enjoying learning enough about this to be able to ask you know, questions all over the place. Um, but you were talking about Route 9, and you were kind of distinguishing between, basically the, you know, from, from here to where the bike path crosses <coughs> and then beyond, right? Mm -hmm. And how it's all essentially zoned as business district, but really, like, the character of, the, of Route 9 changes. Right? It does. Right? Like that's where we get the big box stores and no, nobody wants to live right behind Walmart. But like living next to Sam's Outdoor Outfitters probably wouldn't be such a, you know, such a hassle. Um, you know, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of smaller, quieter businesses in this part of Route 9. And I'm just wondering if there's, there's ways to, to be thinking you know, about the types of housing that could be appropriate for different, sure. for, for different sections of those kinds of districts. Like, sure, like a big apartment complex, like over behind, like near Staples or whatever, like that's different than, you know, a cluster of townhouses uh, behind so, Sam's. So what we have done is we nice. have what's called the Village Center Overlay District, which is one of these inlay maps. Mm -hmm. The Village Center Overlay District is basically the business district from the bridge to the bike path. Okay. And in that overlay district we call for uh, basically smaller scale, mm -hmm. not, uh, I think it's a 12,000 square foot footprint. So 
the hotel at the village barn shops maxed out its the limits for a structure in the village center overlay. You have to have a peak roof. Uh, you have to have some architectural detail, and uh, a you're capped to the size of your footprint and to three stories. I think it is. Um, so even though it is it's the same business district, the same uses are allowed here as are allowed here. Um, they they are forced to be of smaller scale. So if you want to put a super Walmart, you're going to put it here and not here. Um, and it does reflect the fact that there are there are more residential properties along that stretch. And once upon a time, I actually sat down with the assessors and checked where the bills were going. And I, this is old information now. This is like probably about 25 years old. From you know, from here to here, from the bike bridge to the bike path, most of the uh, tax bills had a local address. And from the bike path to the Amherst Town Line, most of the tax bills had a um, non-local and in many cases not a state address. Um, so it just reflects some of the, the patterns of usage over, over time. When you say the bike path, you mean where it crosses? Where the, the rail trail crosses Route 9. <laughs> so it's near the Happy Garden Center. And uh, that seems to be sort of the natural break point. There are only a few houses on the, I think if there are four houses from that point to the Amherst Town Line, that's, it's pretty close to Kyle. I think there are three on the north side and uh, uh, one on the south side in there. So sometimes it's easier to add, rather than creating a separate zone, just add a, a, an allowed use in a, in a zone. Um, and uh, so there's some slicing and dicing here. This little stretch here, so they have the garden center, or whatever they call it now, is right about here, and oh, that's that jut out there is Lowe's. Um, this is zoned industrial back here and down here. Um, is that Mill Valley Road there? This is Mill Valley. Yeah. This is South Maple. Yeah. So uh, the north side of Mill Valley is zoned industrial. There, uh, this is where Ideal Movers is, mm -hmm. and then there is a landscaper in here. Mm -hmm. and that's about all that can fit in there. there. There's a house at the peak, and it has a few acres, uh, but there, there's serious wetlands issues in there. Um, and uh, there's a solar field in here. No, let's see, there's a solar field uh, up here. And uh, yeah, this is South Maple. So there's a solar field on, mm -hmm. on the north side in there. Again, wetlands issues. Um, and uh, actually, this is Mill Valley. That's the bike path. That's Mill Valley. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so the solar is. The ideal is in here, the solar is in here. Or somewhere. Yeah, there. In there. Um, so some of this doesn't have any real use. For example, I, this is a relic. I think I showed you on the first tax map that industrial was up against the Amherst Town line, and then Route 116 came in and pretty much bisected, sliced off most of it. Uh, and UMass ended up buying most of it. Uh, apparently, we get a, uh, a payment in lieu of tax bonus for, have, for them occupying our industrial land. Mm -hmm. Although, there's not uh, a whopping of this is 116. Stop and Shop is in here. 
and uh, there's well, it's really wet in there. Uh, we had someone come in with a proposal to rezone. Um, let's see where did they want to go? Uh, where the bus garage is now up on Rocky Hill Road, just across 116. And there's a parking lot for the uh, our school bus contractor in there. Um, somebody wanted to put in a student housing uh, apartment development. Uh, swimming pool, community uh, space, uh, walk to the campus. And they could not figure out, there, there wasn't enough dry land in there for them to do it. That's why Alexandra liked that area so much. She knew it was Belfast. habitat, yeah. Yeah, well, between 116, so essentially 116 is a dam on one side. <laughs> and um, it, it, yeah, it's, it's just become not, not particularly useful. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so that's why they're, we leave it zoned for industrial. There's no <coughs> reason not to. It doesn't matter what it's zoned. Conservation Commission won't let anyone do anything there. Does UMass pay anything to have it for use of our own nuclear sewer system? Uh, so we have, uh, not specifically, we have um, a community agreement with the university that gets negotiated annually. And they pay us for um, kind of a, a, an impact, if you will. So they Part of the conversation is always kind of like, okay, well, in order to get there, you have to cut through here. It taxes our police department, our fire department, like <coughs> that. So we get a cash payment of about $65,000 from the university annually. Um, and then oftentimes we can negotiate maybe like an equipment purchase. So like when you see like the speeding signs slow down or whatever, those the university bought those for us. Um, but it's it's an annual event to negotiate with them. They have to be a little bit nice because we control the uh, one day liquor licenses for the uh, <laughs> Holland Center. <so. laughs> they want their liquor licenses. Thank you, Bill. Okay, Bill. Thank you. So technically, the sewage treatment plant on the edge of the UMass campus is Tom Dammer's property in Hatton. Well, no, they they have bought it. Oh, they, they bought it. It's not. You, There's a car though, right? Yeah. The, the, no, I don't think so. The, the, you know, the, it may be it may be tax exempt, but uh, it is between 116 and uh, let's see, this is Rocky Hill yeah, Road, so it's it's right up in there, and that is Town of Hadley property, uh, and they. But they own it. It's not town. Of, it isn't part of the town of Amherst. It is property owned by the town of Amherst, in located in Hadley. Mm -hmm. Which <laughs> Amherst also does in uh, their part of their water supply is in Pelham, mm -hmm. and I believe they have the same arrangement out there. They they own. They bought up the land around their reservoirs, um, but it is Pelham land. And they also have a uh, an animal, a stray animal shelter there. Their their pound is in there. So these deals were made a long time ago. <clears throat> Reasonably long. The uh, the um, animal control building was about 10, 15 years ago, twenty years ago. So I, I've been doing this for thirty. 35 years come April, and I'm still third in seniority on a five-member board. And the only reason I got to be third is the guy who was third died in office. So, uh, so yeah, we have we have longevity on, on the board. And the scary thing was that for five years I was the youngest person on the board.
we set aside a time next week as well. And I'm wondering if you would have some ideas about how we could use that time to really look at creating opportunity. Um, sure. I, I don't know. Molly, do you want to, would you be interested in perhaps a joint meeting of some sort? Yeah, I think I think that would be a good idea. Um, and unfortunately, next month it's not going to work. I don't think. But I think one of the things we need to figure out is, you know, again, this Housing and Economic Development Committee was created really to address some of these issues. Um, and then clearly, your committee was also created to address kind of a, a, a myriad, you know. Um, set of issues with housing being a, a single component. So it, I think it would make sense for the committees to get together. I, what I'm foreseeing is that um, it seems like some of the legwork, so to speak, that you're talking about actually would fall under the purview of our committee. Yet, I think you used the word impetus before. The impetus for prioritizing, I can certainly see it, it, your committee playing a very key role there to and that's why you know right now we've got that um, housing production plan is in the works um, one thing you'll get used to is things take time <laughs> so you know right now we're working on the the grant funding side of that but the i think part of the idea behind this housing production plan was to have an independent third party you know presumably pine valley uh, planning commission get the data, the actual hardcore data, um, in front of both of our committees to take a look to say, okay, where do we want to set the priority, right? Um, and then that will also dovetail into the, the zoning that's available now, which presumably would feed the planning board information so that billing company could be thinking about, okay, are there zoning changes that should be made in anticipation of these projects? So it's more of a proactive approach than we, we've taken, and I think Bill has outlined, you know, the planning board being all volunteers and in the absence of a, a formal town planner, um, they try to be as proactive as they can, but oftentimes are put in a position of being more reactive. So when a developer comes in and says, hey, this is what I want to do, that may get the ball rolling. But then it's the conundrum of, well, if the developers all know that our zoning doesn't allow it, then they may not come forward with the project because they don't think that they can get it in. So I think a joint meeting would be really, really helpful. Is Heidi actually uh, actively seeking development? Are we reaching out to developers? To no. Not, not no, yet. We have no one tasked with that, and uh, and it also it, it, we're not playing field. We have people who want to come here. Playing field, there are reasons to live there, but business isn't looking to locate in playing field. It's too plain. Uh, <laughs> it's so, high and far away. Um, so, so who would do that? Who would be active in, in well, that's, to get businesses here? That's, that's an interesting conversation to have about whether there's even a need for it. We, there is a demand. So consider that Amherst, <coughs> Amherst discourages development, basically. They may say they don't, but they do. Um, we don't have three and a half grocery stores in Hadley because we eat so much. <clears throat> we, have, <coughs> we have all of that because people see 30,000 cars a day on Route 9 and they're there with their hand out to pick your pocket on the way by. Um, so the demand is, the, the demand is there. <coughs> we don't have to send someone out to drum up demand. Um, now, would it be, are we getting the demand we want? Uh, that's another conversation. That's, 
That, that, that's, that to me, that's the conversation. Yeah. And <coughs> it's I'm in control of, you know, what, what is um, financially, it being a, a single component, financially what's in the town's best interest? Um, you know, is, are we better off having mixed use than a mall where the, if you read the tea leaves, they're only going to be looking for tax abatements from here forward because the commercial property, I mean, they're not going to have the tenants, et cetera. So is, is there a way to repurpose that in such a way that it increases the tax base for the entire town? But as Bill said, without costing us, you know, money somewhere else so that you negate the value of that. Or is it worth making the investment because then other projects could follow along those lines as well. And we're just starting to really have these conversations. Um, and the other thing is that the university has, in our negotiations with them, indicated an interest in forming a task force where there would be representation from the university, um, the town of Hadley, to talk about what the university's desires are. Um, and not, not student housing only. I mean, talking about, you know, if they want to be the flag, they are the flagship campus, but they want to continue to be a premier research institution. Most research institutions have a, a corpus of um, corporations that want to be proximate because that's the feeder system for their employees. We don't have any of that right now, and the university would very much like to have that, but they don't really have somebody that's pursuing that, going out and pounding the pavement on 128 to say, hey, why don't you move something out here to Route, route 9 and Hadley, you know? Is, is there a Hadley body of officials who are tasked with dealing with businesses, bringing business to Hadley, bringing Developing Hadley. We do not have an economic development function. That's Should something. We? Um, it was in the budget, and it was we we had a, a planner slash economic development position that was in the or discussed about being in the budget. I don't think it ever actually made it into the budget, though, right? Uh, no. It, it it was cut. So. Is this something that the select board should be dealing with, leading on? Um, the select board, in concert with the planning. You know, you, one can't really get in front of the other. I mean, I, in it, Nirvana is to have the boards working cooperatively together to, to bring that conversation to town meeting for buy-in. So the, the conversations have been happening, but then, to be honest with you, uh, it, once COVID hit, I mean, everything came to a screeching halt. And, um, but I think it'll be resurrected. So, so is there a leader in this effort? Is one board leading the other? Are you the leader? Well, I, I think the Housing and Economic Development Committee has a voice for with both boards. So that's why for the housing production plan and, and where. And we also, the, the planning board worked for years to get an affordable housing trust fund created. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, <clears throat> we have, things are going on. Uh, but is there a, is there one person tasked with it? No. No, we don't. We have a very thin bench at Town Hall. Uh, the, uh, I think know, people are all standing. I don't think there's a bench. Right. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, we have uh, the t town administrator has one support person who has already been assigned so many support functions like procurement officer, licensing officer, that She's almost an assistant town administrator, and there's no, and she still has to be the one to type up the letters and things like that. My wife is the town treasurer. Uh, she gets help two days a week to stuff envelopes and run through the postage meter. Uh, and uh, planning board completely, you know, it's just the five of us, no support staff. Conservation Commission had one part time support person who resigned in the big blow-up, uh, as, as did several of their members. Uh, Zoning Board of Appeals has no support person, uh, except very nominal support from 
one other person in town hall who herself is overworked. Uh, you know, there's an assistant town clerk who comes in uh, as needed. Uh, there is the tax collector has an, has a full time assistant because they're always ha having money run through there. People are always paying bills. Um, My understanding was that the, the select people are the people who are administering the town. They they are the ones who are leading the town. But I'm getting the impression that there's no leadership. It just depends on people getting together and sort of shooting through ideas. Well, it depends on how you define leadership. Yes, the select board is the executive board for the town, and it sets priorities, but it chooses its own priorities to set. Right. So you're, you're um, poking at a very interesting conversation about governance and, yes. and uh, how the town is structured. So if you go to Mass General Law, so, so after the camera's off, but uh, uh, let me show you how to get to all of this. As I told you, uh, everything is online. So you can look at these maps in as much detail as you can stand. Um, so this is the homepage, happyma.org. You go to records and bylaws. Did I hit the wrong? I hit the wrong. Forms and documents, I'm sorry. And there are documents for every department. Planning board just has master plan. You click on that and you see two master plans, the 2005 and the 2017 update. Uh, you click on that and you'll launch. Yep, we got, uh, oh, it's taking it. It's time to download, so I'm going to just cancel that. But that's, how, that's where you find it. And all of the maps that I was showing you are the appendix to the master plan update. Thank you so much. We've reached the end of this time period that we've set aside. We do have you coming to speak with us again next week. And we can certainly talk about uh, where we head with that. And, I, I think I can say for our committee that we're kind of looking at how to help. Um, but I do want to thank you for being here uh, and uh, thank you for those of you who are here and asking questions and showing your interest. Uh, we appreciate it and we look forward to talking with you again. Okay. Thank you.